Yeah. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tobias Dekens. I work at Epost. We're the Lanyard guys, which is kind of weird for me because you all look like colleagues to me, and it's confusing. But anyways, um, I wanted to talk about micro-puzzling. And you might wonder what that is. Well, it's a self-phrased term we came up with while working on a new web front-end, which from a technical perspective is basically an email client on top of a set of microservices. And I wanted to give some learnings and key takeaways we had and share those. So to start off, um, a little agenda. First of all, I wanted to set up an hypothesis about front-end development at the moment, which is kind of an observation of the status quo and um, just saying that we're yielding the same results over the last couple of years, I think. Then I wanted to give some symptoms, which kind of will fulfill the hypothesis if you ob um, observe the sympt symptoms within your system during development. And then I will give a clue to the puzzle, which is kind of, kind of how we tried to avoid the symptoms and how we yeah, basically built the whole thing. So the hypothesis basically is the uh, monolithic trap. It's the gigantic trap front-end development is kind of always moving towards, always building monolithic applications. But moreover, I would claim that the level of interactivity within your application determines the likelihood of building a front-end monolith. So now you might wonder, what is interactivity in this sense? And I would say, interactivity is kind of on a scale from static to dynamic. So if you have very static content, just like a article page, there's not much of interactivity going on. But if you have very dynamic content where the user in inputs something, you need to validate that input, you need to re react to the input, um, and you have propagating state throughout your application, um, it's going to be very interactive and you will most likely build a monolith. And that's a sad thing to do because it's not very good to build a monolithic application because after all, um, you'll not be able to move for a long time. So the symptoms for me, <coughs> we observed, um, in the community when you, when you build a new application, fulfilling the hypothesis, are, for example, you're always in this kind of framework versus problem discussion. As a front-end developer, um, you always get to know new frameworks. Every two weeks, there's a new one. And I would say, if it was me, like CycleJS, yay! And you would wonder what CycleJS is. But there are all these frameworks which solve problems, but they might not be the problem you have. And they don't fit the problem, and they just solve others. So just be aware of that issue, that you're not on the hype machine and just blindly following trends. And then there's this weird to-do MVC syndrome, where people just skip through to-do MVC um, applications and look at 10 lines of code and always go, whoa, 10 lines of code, it does so much, but you never look behind the scenes and look at the abstractions of the framework and look at the hidden cost of just adapting that framework. And we're very love-struck by the syndrome of to-do MVC and having very little lines of code doing so much. And then you have a lack of boundaries issue, where at some point the complexity of your application rises, um, business requirements get more and more complex, just over time it's a natural thing, and fighting the complexity to still have simplicity within your application is very complex and it's a very hard fight to have. But at some point mostly components within your application get very entangled, so they depend on one another and changing one thing breaks the other. So in the beginning it's kind of all fine, but then you end up but with a very complex application. And then you're losing focus. You include all sorts of libraries, you just get moving somehow, and all the libraries have a cost, like you include a Lodash or something, but you cannot get rid of it. And gain is very easy, but dieting is hard. And then you just lose completely focus and have this technology exaggeration yet in the beginning, where it just chose some very bloated framework and you can't move any, any, anymore. And then you've proven my hypothesis right, and you have a monolithic, monolithic front-end application, your kickoff advantages are lost, you're in first gear again, and your manager pro probably claps at you, and you have to rebuild the whole thing again. So how can you avoid these kind of symptoms? That's what we set out to ask ourselves. And from the microservices guys, um, we learned that having a set of um, simple guidelines might be very helpful. So why not just say, we want forced boundaries within our front-end application. Things are not meant to interact maybe at times, or they don't reach into one another's state. And they might communicate through events, but very rarely that is needed. And why not have one API providing data and one component ho being hosted on that same API, consuming that data, so you can deploy a set of components and data provide providers independently? And why not define interactivity in the beginning and kind of just state how interactive the application is meant to be, and don't discuss, like, do you want to build an app or a website, because that's silly to do. And use documents. They're kind of the hidden power feature of the web. In the imitation, I think, of iOS, we kind of lost the whole vision of and the power of, of documents along the way. So 
composition is kind of a clear part here. Um, yeah, very important part, where you just think of simple things within your application, and you combine them and make more complex things. So if you look at an email application, as I said, we're bu building an email application. If you look at it, this is Apple Mail, you might find some components, and you, 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 you just build them, and at some point, you figure out, like, well, this is going to be a monolith again, right? Because it's one application, there's no documents, there's no clear separation, there's no boundaries, no clear boundaries, at least. And then we thought, well, what if we say on the left-hand side there is a folder list, it contains a set of components, and data is provided by an API. In the middle there's a list, it contains a set of components, data is provided by an API, and on the right-hand side there's just a details pane, and data is provided by an API. So you co-host all these components and the data producers, and then you have very strict separation of, um, of your application in the front end. So if you look at it, even though you still have lots of components going on, you want to combine them and want to have a single source for components because they might look alike. So you just have a component library or a style guide, and you develop through that component library. You don't just update it in the end when you change the component or just like styling of an element. You de develop through it and you create these higher order components, which are just augmented with a data provider, maybe some events to communicate with our environment so other components can interact, and then you just deliver it to the, to the browser. browser. So what that gives you from an architectural perspective is kind of a very vertical dreamland architecture where you have microservices at the bottom, they collect all that data, they do fancy stuff, blob handling, and then there's a very uh, little aggregator API on top. It's, it talks to the microservices and gets data in a very tight format for those components in the front end. So the components don't need to do overfetching, they don't get too much data, they don't need to collect relational data and do fetching after they even found something. And these aggregator APIs deliver a set of components, so basically a bundle of JavaScript and CSS. And that gets delivered to the browser, and the browser assembles the application, so it can independently release all those components. So, as you might have guessed, orchestration is kind of a key part here. We decided to do that in, in the browser, so every vertical describes what its dependencies are, what version they're in. So every vertical has one manifest of those dependencies which lists it. Um, we inject those dependencies in the browser, then cache them, so the next time the application boots a bit quicker. So what that basically means during assembly is um, you have dynamic dependencies. The application starts off, all the verticals get asked, like, what are your versions of components you want on the page? You get those components on the page, maybe they're already cached, you don't need to have a request again, and you can do these kind of uh, resemble and upgrade thing, which is what we do where you the customer gets an N-1 version, which is basically from local storage cache. And in the background, we ask the verticals, and we're like, oh, do we have a new state? Do we have to dedupe our cache or update it? And then you can have independent deployments between um, all those verticals, which is kind of nice because it enforces the boundaries between um, the components, after all. So also some technical leads. Um, we learned that libraries are quite nicer than frameworks in this regard, because frameworks create this cross-boundary whole page dependency within your application, and just having small libraries which do one thing and do one thing well kind of moves away from this, and you can then change parts uh, independently within your application. Also, no shared code. That sounds quite strange for front-end developers, but it feeds into this um, issue where you just have want to replace things, and if you have shared code, you can't do it with, with certainty that nobody else depends on it. And having a monorepository is quite nice. I heard that backend people have started doing it too with uh, microservices, just to avoid like duplicate configuration, test setup, uh, dependency management. So there's one repository, it contains all the subcomponents, all the verticals, all that stuff, and then it's a bit easier. For example, on the front end, the Babel project is one which I believe has like a thousand subprojects within one repo, so it's quite crazy. Anyways, um, there's still some iffy bits to be solved. Um, for us, it was CSS, because by its nature, it's, a, it's global and it's a bit of a mess in that sense, and the cascade kind of m makes it almost impossible with certainty to say that you change some part of the application and you don't break another one. But by treating it as code and just inlining it with components, you kind of have this certainty, and you change a kind of component, you tweak it, and you know that's only there where change happens. And the URL is global state, um, but still it shouldn't be broken. The URL is the key part of the web, and it makes it really nice. So we started to just propagate it via events throughout the application so components can react um, to a URL change and can be backwards compatible with it. 
Um, and then we're in between HTTP 1 and 2. So in HTTP 2, requests will become cheaper. So you can have smaller bundles, more requests. And due to multiplexing, it's not going to be that expensive. And we don't have to still live in the world where main CSS is one file, which just has all the CSS in it. And first and foremost, um, I think as front-end developers, we should respect the platform and not break it, because it will be in constant movement. And if we can't change within the application and not can change parts at a time within the application, um, we just end up in the big rewrite loop again. And yeah, our manager's going to hate us. So thanks. That's all I have. 15 minutes. If you want to give me feedback on a small project I was working on, this weird name at the bottom, it does the orchestration bit in the browser. So things can be independent. Thanks. Questions? Two little front-end guys here. Nobody, really. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question over there? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, as you highlighted, the CSS is still a problem because of the, the global state of CSS. Uh, what was your solution so far? Because there are some, some approaches like inline CSS where front-end developers would say, is that a good idea, but or CSS mo modules or BAM. Um, what was your approach to address I, I, that? I think inline seeing as CSS straight away is kind of a bad thing because you don't get any reuse and at points you want reuse. Um, we did BAM, so that kind of helped. So at least... The bad thing about BAM, though, is it's a convention, so it's up to people to follow it, and everybody can break it. Um, I'm a fan of CSS modules, even though I don't believe it's going to be part of a standard anytime soon, this independent th CSS um, thing, but yeah, at, le at least follow some conventions, otherwise you're ruined, I think. Uh, you talk about um, dependence, um, catching uh, dif different dependencies and share code uh, yeah. uh, when you're building a, a front-end base uh, application. And uh, could you expand more on, on that process? I mean, how how the different parts of different components of, of your of your web or, or app or whatever you want to call it uh, get their dependencies and update uh, seamlessly uh, in the background? Um, so uh, when, when loading, I mean. Uh, you mean the orchestration bit? Yeah. Um, so it basically is um, we fetch all the manifests, check the versions, which are just SHA-1 hashes of the content of this kind of bundle of a vertical, check if we have it in the cache in local storage. If we do, we just take that one inline or the JavaScript as a script tag. If we don't, we in inject a script tag, just let the browser do all its loading, and then just hook another HTTP request back to the server to get the content to put it in the cache. That's kind of the idea. But I think the whole process of doing that is going to be way easier in the future due to service workers and that kind of stuff because you're closer to the bare metal of a cache and then you don't have to do all these tweaks and script loading things, which are really messy at times. Yeah, we, I mean, obviously, there are parts of shared code. Um, so you can't always avoid them completely. But for example, if you have um, a utility library, we, I wouldn't recommend having a utility library as shared code, just including little functions of that library and just having it redundant in all the modules consuming it. Um, and if you have shared code, the very bad thing is that it just can cause breaking issues. So you update the shared code, and one thing understands what's going on, the other one just breaks. Um, so we've had issues where we had to work around being able to deploy um, one part by upgrade, upgrading shared code and then just the other part and then moving back again. So your suggestion would be um, embedding uh, these small utility libraries in every component, e even if they have, yeah, but maybe they have different little versions of it? Yeah, but on a finer granule way. So not just including all of Lodash, for example, just maybe the find index which you need at that point in time. Okay, thank you. It's like every time our monolith increases, the hash of the CSS changes. Yeah. That's how we, the ops people, check if we deployed everything according to the stuff development wants. 
Yep. More technical questions? Or non-technical questions? <laughs> Equally welcome. Okay, thank you very much.